so might have lost, we might lost Caroline. Uh, Caroline, can you turn on your? Yeah, sorry, I just turned it on. Okay, okay, so good. So um, uh, let's go ahead and get started. We have uh, quite a number of uh, participants logging in already. We have reaching to about 79 sure. right now. So good evening. Um, uh, welcome to another. Thanks, for the audience, if you couldn't mute your mic, we appreciate that. Um, so um, good evening. Uh, my name is Stan. I am uh, um, a member of Kappa Nova. And uh, along with my team, we're going to have this uh, um, young professional seminar series. And today, we're having the third seminar series. And the topic is on medicine, uh, medical doctors, and what it's like to be a medical doctor. So we have uh, three young um, doctors um, uh, from various fields that uh, kindly volunteer to be the speaker for this session. Um, as you all know, at this stage, they have a very busy schedule. So um, we have truly appreciate that they're taking their busy time to give this, this seminar to this audience. Um, I'll yeah. make a can you pick him a decent? Okay. Um, we have various of uh, interference right now, so apologize for that. Um, so Isabella um is um a Dr. Liu, we should call her. Um, is a resident physician in diagnostic radiology uh, at Yale University. Um, she um mm -hmm. like all the speakers, she's grew up locally in Vienna, and she went to a uh, um, um high school TJ. Um. She studied biology at the University of Virginia and went to medical school um, uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Right now, she's doing her residency at the Yale. Um, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Mei Peng. Um, she is uh, stuck in the ICU right now, so she uh, will be joining the seminar a little bit later. Um, she is in her second year um, uh, NSCT. Uh, and a senior resident at the University of California, San Francisco, one another top-notch hospital in the nation. Um, she grew up uh, in Northern Virginia, attended UVA uh, for undergraduate and a New York uh, Medical College for medical school. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys going hiking, um, trying a new restaurant and playing with her <laughs> at uh, Yumi. Uh, the third speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Zhang, um, he actually is right now in her um, assistant professorship at um, uh, Auto Autology uh, Neurotology um, and a medical director of the Northwestern Medical um, uh, School, uh, the Cultural Implant Program. Um, he completed his. Uh... Can we, the audience, please mute yourself? Appreciate that. Um, so she, um, uh, he completed his. Um, uh, residency yeah. specialty at Ohio State University and a subsequent audiology, neurotology, it's a difficult term for me to pronounce, and a skull based surgery fellowship at a Western, a Washington University at St. Louis, and you get amazing um, uh, credentials. Uh, next, I want to introduce the two moderators, talented moderator who will moderate tonight's uh, session, uh, Sarah Gu. Um, she just recently graduated from Berkeley and currently worked at the investment banking um, in New York City. Uh, Karen and Sue, um, she is a 10th grade at the McLean High School. We just recruited her tonight to put her on the spot of being moderator, but I'm uh, very um, confident that she will do an excellent uh, job. So with that, I will turn the panel, um, uh, before I turn the panel to the moderator, I just want to uh, mention a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Um, like we, you know, this is a large seminar. We have uh, right now actually reached the number of 100 participants. Um, please mute your mic and um, we will have the first uh, 60 minutes have the, um, the seminar moderated by the uh, moderator seminar sessions. And then we're followed by Q&A. Please hold all your questions, but we welcome you to submit a question through the chat. We will um, save the last 20 minutes to address those questions. Um, that's it. And uh, Sarah and uh, Karine, uh, please take over. Hi, um, I just wanna say thank you very much for giving your time to give this presentation tonight. And I would like to start off with a question, which is, can you share your journey into medicine and what inspired you to pursue a career as a doctor? And any of you can take this.
Go ahead, Isabella. You go first. Sure, I'll go first. So like my bio said, I wanted to become a doctor ever since high school. So I knew pretty early on. Um, and there were several reasons for that. One, I always had an inclination towards STEM. So I loved biology. I really liked my chemistry classes. So that was kind of the first step. And then the second step was I knew I wanted a job that had the ability to make a very tangible difference in people's lives. I think that is the motivation why a lot of us go into medicine. Um, and then I just really like learning. So as a doctor, you're going to be constantly learning, constantly trying to improve yourself, your skills. And so if you have that curiosity, I think medicine is a really good fit for you. Um, and so my path kind of went from high school at Thomas Jefferson to studying biology at UVA to then going to med school in Cincinnati and then residency. And then now I'm here. So it is quite a long journey, but that is kind of what brought me to, to being here today. Yeah, I think uh, my, also, my journey also has a lot of similar themes is what else said. Um, I was said. Uh, uh, I was a literature major in, in college and I also um, uh, studied some biochemistry as well, but I, I, I really enjoyed the sort of the, um, the combination of the humanities and the sciences and that you definitely get that in medicine. And um, uh, I really appreciated a lot of the narratives that I was reading and, and stuff like that. And I think uh, medicine is a very privileged um, place to be, you know, you're certainly working with patients and, um, and even within a short period of time, you have to, you know, they, they, you know, reveal a lot of very personal, intimate details with you, um, um, that, um, that you work with obviously. And so, um, so I was drawn to that. And I think, I think certainly, um, the challenge of medicine, uh, you know, enjoying, loving to learn those kind of things are, are especially important. And, and now that I'm, um, you know, in my mid thirties and finally having a job, um, you know, it's one of those things where you see a lot of your friends kind of do other careers and, um, you know, high, very, very high achieving careers. And I think the greatest, one of the greatest gifts in medicine is too, is you'd, you'd never have to wonder whether you're doing good for society. Um, it's something that you, it's something that you take for, almost take for granted, if you will, but it's something that you never have to question. You know, I know I have some colleagues that went to law or business and those kind of things, and, you know, they're working very long hours and making plenty of money, but also they do question like, you know, what am I doing with my life? Am I doing anything good or bad? And, and that's something that you really sort of um, have a privilege in being in medicine, in a medical career. It doesn't have to be medicine or it doesn't have to be a you know, medical doctor. Or, you know, there's plenty of ways to be involved in healthcare, but that's something that's, that's really uh, um, a treasure, I think, uh, for being in this field. Great, thank you for sharing, Kevin and Isabella. So our next question is, can you please walk us through a day in your life? And for this is a question for both of you guys. Um, so I'm still in training. So a day in my life right now will probably look very different in about four to five years. But um, just uh, kind of, I can go through what I did today. So every morning, <laughs> my day starts at 7.30 is when I have to show up for a morning lecture. So in radiology, there's like a lot of lectures. Oh, I was muted. Can everyone hear me? Um, so in the morning, it always starts with a morning lecture for an hour. And then afterwards, all the residents, we go to the reading rooms. And so we read our CT scans, our x-rays for the morning. And then we go over those scans with our supervising doctor or attending. And so while we're in the reading rooms, we're reading actual patient scans, we're going through the anatomy, we're learning about the diseases, and then we're learning from our supervising doctors. Um, around noontime, we go for another two hours of lecture um, to learn about various topics like anatomy topics, physics, physiology, and then the afternoon, it's kind of similar. We read scans again. And then my day normally finishes around five. And then I go home. I have some personal time to work out, to pursue my hobbies. And then I do a couple hours of studying at night. And then that's pretty much my day and rinse and repeat Monday through Friday. 
so um, I think uh, now my days are very different from when I was in a trainee. Um, and so, and I think that that is sometimes hard to see as a, as a, a trainee in, in a, um, you know, a surgical field. I think um, my experience is a bit different from um, uh, Isabella there. And um, so residency hours were incredibly long and grueling. Um, and so, and, but it was, um, you know, I did that for a couple of years. We did five years of residency and two years of fellowship. Um, but now uh, life is much, much better. Uh, you know, I think um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the, you know, my clinic starts at 7.30 in the morning. So sometimes I'll have some conferences or before that. Um, and I usually see 25, 30 patients in clinic. Um, and then, um, you know, I'll usually do two and a half days of clinic or something like that uh, a week. And then um, I'm in the OR or the operating room uh, one or two days a week as well. And so on days that I operate, um, you know, uh, we'll do uh, three or four or five procedures um, throughout the day. And, um, um, and then that'll be it. So, you know, when you're, when you're done with your day, when you're done with your surgeries and stuff like that, um, you go home. Um, I think, you know, throughout the week, you're obviously going to have a lot of patient messages and yet you have to answer some urgent, some not urgent. And, you know, I, I rely a lot on my support staff, my nurses and medical assistants that help me and my our administrators that, that help. Um, so uh, uh, the, the perspective changes quite considerably when you go from trainee um, to um, an attending. An attending just means that you've graduated um, all of your training and you're now responsible for your patients directly. Um, and with that is, is the excitement of having your own patients finally, you know, really having your own patients and the responsibility. Um, but also certainly if something uh, goes bad, that's all on you as well. And so um, it's a, it's a large responsibility. It's something that we, you know, train for and, um, you know, prepare for. And, um, but it's a, it's a very, very rewarding job at the end of the day. And then I'm on call, you know, once every, uh, it's, it's different. Like every, every job is going to be a little bit different on how, how you take call on those kind of things. Um, and so certainly being at an academic institution, I have residents that assist with call and take the brunt of the, the first line calls and those kind of things when I am on call for a week or so at a time, but I'm only on call, you know, once every, um, uh, you know, 10 or 12 weeks or something like that. So it's, uh, it's rel relatively manageable. Thanks. That's, that's really insightful. And um, how do you handle stress and maintain your mental health, given the demanding nature of your profession? I think maintaining mental health and relieving stress has a lot to do with just reminding yourself that you're a whole human being and you're not just a doctor, you're not just a medical student or a medical resident, you're Isabella Liu, and you have interests outside of medicine. You have people who are supporting you and who care about how you feel outside of work, outside of school. So something that really helped me was holding on to the hobbies that I enjoyed doing before medical school. So I always loved cooking. I always loved learning new recipes. I loved travel. I loved keeping in touch with my friends. So things like that, just whatever brings you fulfillment, what brings you joy, just hold on to those things, even if you're busy, even if you feel like you don't deserve to do them, or you don't have time to do those things. Um, I think that helped me a lot. And also just not isolating yourself. So medical school residency can be very isolating, because you're all working very long hours, sometimes separate from the rest of your class, you could just be the only person on a team and not seeing any of your friends for a long time can be very isolating. And I think also reminding yourself that you're all experiencing some of the same issues. If you share about those things, I think it helps as well and just supporting each other. Yeah, I think that's a, a wonderful answer. Um, and certainly, you know, there's a, I think certainly early on, especially when I was in college and medical school and stuff like that, you know, if you grow up in an environment where, you know, a lot of the people around you are successful academically and those kind of things, and, you know, certainly being in Northern Virginia, we're all subject and being Chinese American, I think, you know, we're all subject Daddy. to those pressures and stuff. And so, um, uh, you know, I think if you wrap up, if you're, if you wrap your entire 
identity around your academics or your, you know, your job and your profession, um, you can lose, you know, lose sight of a lot of things. So just like, you know, just like Isabella said, you're, you're a person outside of medicine. You have to remind yourself of that. I think, um, because certainly when the job gets really tough and when the job um, gets very, very demanding, it's easy to feel like that's all there is in your life. And, um, and you have to constantly, um, um, think outside of that. Right. And so, um, you know, I certainly was, um, you know, made some faults, you know, when I was a resident, just thinking that like, okay, well, this is just, this is just who I'm going to be. And, you know, this is what my life is going to be like. And so my default was like, I just don't have time for this and that, and those kind of things. And you would say no to things. And I think looking back, I would have sort of, you know, prioritized a lot more of those things outside of work, uh, you know, um, just, uh, because once you do have more time, you know, it's your, it's your support network, it's your friends and, and your family and, and uh, people that share your experiences that you go to for support and trying to keep things level headed. And um, because, you know, if you, if you don't take care of yourself, there's no way you can take care of your patients. And um, certainly if you go to work with a certain type of attitude, it's just going to, everyone's going to see it and it's just going to lead to bad patient care and those kind of things. So I think it's very important that you practice things that give yourself insight on who you are, like, whether it's, you know, um, um, just kind of doing some introspection journaling or whatever, just kind of selection, those things are, are really important during, you know, your training periods and, and being in school and those kind of things. So. Oh, great. I thought, you know, you guys both brought up a really good point discussing how having, you know, life and an identity outside of career is really important. So if you were to describe yourself in two, act two to three adjectives, how would you describe yourself? That's a challenging one. <laughs> Just because, you know, life changes, you know, I mean, who I was personally 10 years ago and who I was five years ago is very, very different from who I am now. And I think that just kind of goes to, um, different stages of this whole process, right? Like, you know, I was, you know, I, I was in medical school for four years, right? Then I took a year off between medical school and residency. I did five years of residency then did two years of fellowship. And then I finally have a job. And I can tell you at every single one of those stages, there's been significant changes and differences to who I am as a person um, throughout those periods. Um, so I don't know. I think resilient is, is one important thing. I think how you kind of take stresses, I think anybody in medicine, how you handle stress, how you handle failure um, is, is important and how you come about and sublimate that experience is, is, is important um, for yourself and for your patients. Um, you know, I think everyone in medicine is hardworking. That's not that special, um, but you definitely have to be hardworking. Um, Okay, great. All right. Then, um, Isabella, do you have anything you want to share for this I question? I would say I had some extra time to think about this, but I would say definitely meticulous. So as a physician, you do need to have some attention to detail because you carry a huge responsibility. So you have to be someone that's very diligent, um, detail-oriented, and accountable. Um, I would also say that I'm loyal. So... I think loyalty to your patients, you know, sticking by them, even if it gets tough, even if you have bad news to give them, knowing them, telling them that you're going to be there for them no matter what. I think that's very important um, because sometimes even if you can't treat someone, if you can't cure them, it's important that they know you're still there for them. Um, and then lastly, I would say probably just... I guess, compassionate. And that doesn't just go towards your patients. It also goes towards your colleagues. So I think in medicine, it's, they always say medicine is a team sport, right? And not every single player on your team is going to be at 100% every day. That's just impossible, right? So if someone makes a mistake, if someone needs some extra help, make sure you're there for them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. how the whole team can succeed. So I would say meticulousness, mm -hmm. 
loyalty and passion are very important. Oh, how can you agree with that? Thank you. Okay, so next, our next question is kind of about expectation versus reality. And sometimes these expectations um, might not match reality. So our next question is, what are some common misconceptions about being a doctor that you would like to address? Um. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I mean, I think, you know, certainly just again, you know, like what you, what you know about medicine as a high school student versus what you know about medicine as a, you know, college student versus even what you know about medicine as a medical student. And heck, even like when you're in the residency, there's a lot that you're like, wow, I didn't realize we did that or something like that. There's a, just so much within each specialty that um, you don't, it, it's hard to kind of quantify how little you know. Um, so just kind of keeping an open mind about things. And, you know, I remember, you know, growing up, Grey's Anatomy was a big thing and everyone that watched a bunch of Grey's Anatomy, they understood medicine from Grey's Anatomy. Like there's, that's nothing, absolutely nothing like what real life is like, you know, the amount of drama and craziness that happens on that show. Um, and so, um, yeah, but I think, um even even within my specialty for for example of ear nose and throat ent you know which is head and neck surgery um there's so many different things i didn't even realize that we did even when i was an intern um and so until i found out through later years of my residency that i you know kind of understood about the field and decided to do fellowship um so i don't know what do you think? <laughs> Sorry, oh, I didn't. I didn't get, really give a good answer to that. Um, I would say one misconception that people have about doctors is that I think based off the TV shows like Grey's Anatomy, they think doctors get to spend a lot of time with their patients. Um, certainly, if you work in an office like in primary care, you are seeing maybe thirty patients a day. But you're probably only seeing each patient for maybe 15, 20 minutes as an appointment slot, which is very little time to address all of their questions and their problems sometimes, especially if they have a very complicated or long medical history. Also, even in the hospital, I know sometimes patients complain like, oh, it's been 12 hours and I haven't seen a doctor. I'm sitting in this bed. I haven't seen the doctor today. But Typically, the doctor will probably come in sometime in the morning just to see how the patient is doing, um, do an exam on the daily, and then go back and figure out what the plan is going to be. So a lot of what a doctor does is maybe behind the scenes and not directly in front of the patient. Um, so those things may be writing notes, writing orders, talking to nurses, talking to other specialists. Um, talking to insurance companies, doing paperwork, things like that. So that's a lot of things that are not patient facing, but are very important in providing care. Um, so this kind of opens up a whole other topic of physician burnout, because so much of this is not what people originally thought they were going into medicine to do. Um, so I think a huge misconception is that like, if you become a doctor, you're just going to spend all day talking to patients. Um, and I think the realistic um, reality is that you probably won't be spending that much time with your patients. You know, it's funny about those TV shows, and this was a great point you raised. It's like, you know, all in all the TV shows, you know, they like to show like the, the physician or the staff actively interacting with the patient one on one, looking at them, kind of talking to them, blah, blah, blah. You know, 90% of medicine now is delivered in front of a computer screen right? It's the majority of it is typing stuff and putting in orders and, and, you know, documenting this and documenting that and those kind of things and things that lead to burnout are things like excessive documentation burdens and those kind of things. That's, you know, so much of medicine is delivered through, uh, you know, electronic health record at this point. There are very few practices nowadays that are still using paper charts and those kind of things. Um, uh, so that's a big misconception. I think, 
Um, and then a misconception is like, you know what, if I, if I go into medicine, I don't really know what I, kind of medicine I want to do that. You're not going to find your type of, you, you're not going to find your, you know, specialty. And I think there's just so much in medicine and so many different specialties. There's something for every single personality type and every single kind of person and intellect and, you know, um, personality type and, and everything, you know? And so, um, Another one of the big real, you know, unfortunate sort of, or you can say unfortunate or not, but um, misunderstandings is that really, you know, medicine in many ways is a business and it's a business that functions just like everything else in business. You know, there's financial incentives to certain things and, you know, that does guide how some people practice and there are, you know, financial burdens in some ways. Um, and the way some hospital systems and practices are organized is simply, you know, a lot of it is financially, right? It's financially, if it, if it, if it can't, if something cannot make money, it cannot stay afloat, if you will. And even though, um, you know, we in medicine obviously are doing a lot of things for, for our own, you know, for the generosity and goodwill of our patients, there are some, a lot of sort of other factors at play in the real world, um, that are very much business driven and those kind of things. And, and, um, so it's just some of those things that you just don't think about when you're a student. Um, and then, and then I think lastly too, like, I remember when I was going through this kind of earlier on in medical school, perhaps like, you know, these preconceived notions about what certain specialties are like, like surgeons are like this and non-surgeons are like that and this and that they're completely false. Um, and so there's a lot of misconception. I think that, you know, um, and um, yeah, a lot of misconceptions about, you know, and I think that probably does stem from some of the media portrayals of various types of people and specialties and those kind of things. Um, so just kind of keep an open mind and be aware that you're not going to know exactly what's going on and kind of what medicine is supposed to be like, or it could be like, and those kind of things as you, you know, navigate this process, I think probably be best for, for everyone kind of going through this. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those aspects of medicine. I, I actually didn't know that before. And um, yeah. So just adding on to misconceptions, um, have you ever struggled with just stereotypes in your experience and what is your experience with facing them personally? Uh, I mean, being an Asian male in medicine, I think the stereotypes work favorably to be honest with you. Um, uh, if it's specific to medicine, people, you know, patients will be like, oh, you know, Asian guy, that makes sense. He's the doctor, whatever, you know, and take that for what you will. I mean, that's, that's not the right thing to say, but I definitely, you know, I trained the Midwest and, you know, I definitely got some, some responses like that, if you will, you know, I don't, I personally didn't face a lot of like, um, discriminatory things. Um, but I have to recognize that it's also being an Asian male in medicine. I think that's, that's some of the privileges that I get to enjoy in some ways. I will say personally, I've never experienced discrimination based on my race. Um, I will say as a female in medicine, sometimes you can experience differential treatment, especially by your superiors. Um, one very common example is that, so in medical school, you're being evaluated on your skills, your ability to work in teams, things like that. Um, in general, a lot of female students will have more comments about their personality, um, how they come off more than their clinical skills, um, which is, you know, not ideal because you want comments on your um, evaluation saying how good of an actual doctor you are, not just how likable you are. Um, and I will also say as an Asian female, sometimes the stereotype can be that we are very meek and shy and not willing to be like that, the loudest voice in the room and be a leader. So I have found myself sometimes trying to overcompensate for that, such as thinking more out loud, even though I'm more of an introvert, I prefer to think through all of my thoughts before speaking, but sometimes 
people won't know what you're thinking unless you say them out loud. And so in order to demonstrate that you know things and that you can do things, you have to tell people you can do those things. Um, and so if you're similarly an introverted person, but you want to do these more extroverted jobs, um, that's something you can start practicing when you're still in high school. Um, just putting yourself out there, not being afraid to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong, right? Because you're still a student, you're still learning. Um, so that's what I have to say on that. Great, thank you. Um, all right, our next question is, um, has there been a very memorable experience or patient interaction that has stood out to you or has, you know, played a has kind of had a significant impact on you? And can you share that with everybody? Um, yeah, I, so yeah, yeah, I've, I've had quite a lot of, 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 you know, important personal memories, I think both good and bad, you know, um, from, from patient encounters, um, some things at the, you know, there are stories of the highs of highs where you feel like, you know, wow, this is, this is why I did it. And then you're, you know, you have encountered, you know, horrible patient scenarios that, you know, where patients pass away or something really bad happens and stuff like that. And navigating those circumstances, I think all sort of help you shape kind of who you are as a physician. I think for me personally, I, um, you know, I do, I, um, one of my biggest passions is our, you know, helping people hear better again. So I do a lot of cochlear implant surgery. Cochlear implant is a, is a, um, a device that's surgically placed, um, that, um, allows, you know, adults, children, babies, you know, to hear again, um, or if they're, you know, children are born deaf and, you know, they'll be able to hear with that device. And so it can be a pretty life-changing thing. And I remember as an intern, um, you know, if uh, at, at a children's hospital, our children's hospital, I remember seeing um, a just the very bubbly, effervescent, you know, 12 year old girl in, in our clinic. And, you know, she had long hair and, she, you know, she was talking to me. I didn't really know why she was there. You know, I was an intern. I didn't know anything. And, and I was talking to her and I said, you know, I was just like, oh, you know, asking her about school and this kind of that. And I walked outside the room. I'm like, why in the world is she here? I don't understand why she's seeing us today. And the nurses kind of laugh at me a little bit and they say, well, you know, she's uh she's here for her disability paperwork i'm like what disability does she have and they're like well she's deaf she can't hear anything she had but she had cochlear implants placed when she was really young at, at the, you know under a year old and with that with the ability to hear if you think about like how we develop our ability to produce sound and language we can't really say a word we've never heard before right so our ability to to understand and you know um and developed language and speech skills, you know, depends uh, a lot on our hearing, or entirely upon our hearing ability. And so the fact that she had no, you know, sort of accent or was speaking perfectly, you know, good English, I was like, wow, that's really, that's a really impactful thing that I could sort of dedicate my whole career to. And so that's certainly now, you know, a big part of my life and, so, you know, building the cochlear implant program at Northwestern here in Chicago, you know, just, um, a week ago, actually, I had um, I went to peek in on an activation. An activation visit is when after the implant is placed and the the implant is turned on by our audiologist. Yes. And I can tell you, I mean, everybody in that room was crying. The patient was crying. The patient's sister was crying. The patient's mother was mm -hmm. crying. Our audiologist was in tears. Just to, just how you know this person had been living in silence for so long, had been struggling to communicate, and now they're able to hear again. That person is mid forties, and so. Those are really, really rewarding moments um, where you feel like, wow, you know, I did that. I was able to help that person that's such a profound way and um, makes definitely makes you feel like all the long years of training were, were definitely worth it. So. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I think I would rather just people ask about his career, you know. So I will say a very memorable patient experience for me was very early on in my clinical rotations in medical school. So the way medical school works is the first two years, you're basically just in a classroom, like regular school. And then your third year, you start going to the hospital to actually work with patients. And so on my very first patient interaction, 
there was this teenager who just got a diagnosis of a lifelong chronic illness, like an illness that would change her life forever. And I remember as a medical student, I went back to talk to her later because I wanted to make sure that she understood everything that the um, other doctors had told her. And I wanted to just make sure she was okay. And I remember that her mom and this patient were very grateful that I took the time just to check back in with her. They had a ton of questions for me that I did not have the knowledge or skills to answer, right? Because I was a brand new medical student. I was way less skilled than anyone else on the team. But I feel like that just reminded me that, like I said earlier, even if you don't have the ability to help someone, just being there for them can go a long way. Um, and so I think those moments very much remind me like why I went into medicine. Wow, those are all super touching and thank you for sharing. Um, the next question that I have is more related to medicine and technology. So as you know, everybody knows recently AI has been a really big topic. And Isabella, I think you previously mentioned that a lot of the work for a doctor, you know, or Kevin, you mentioned also 90% of it is behind a computer now. Um, so I was curious to see, you know, the pa in the past few years, have you guys seen any how do you think technology has impacted, you know, the medical field or in your day to day? Um, has there been any useful technology that has, you know, simplified your tasks? It can be AI related or any sort of general technology. I think AI has some very exciting things happening in radiology. I mean, I feel like people always talk about how the robots are going to take over radiology and then all radiologists will be forced to retire. Um, I think, so our hospital uses an AI called AI doc. And so whenever we open um, our list in the morning with all of the scans that have to be read for the day, it can be very overwhelming seeing like a hundred x-rays that need to be read, right? But the AI program, will kind of flag certain x-rays that are probably going to be abnormal, um, either identifying a very dangerous thing that needs to be addressed immediately or um, moving that exam to the top of our list to make sure that we look at it first. So I think AI has really cool implications in improving like workflow, making sure we get to the most dangerous life-threatening scans first, instead of going through all the normal scans and then finally reaching a life-threatening scan and it is already hours past. Um, I think also AI can help us see certain things that we may miss. Um, and I think it just overall makes radiologists and um, doctors more efficient. Um, of course, AI is yes. not always right. So one example is like, for example, when you write an essay in Word, there's spell check, right? But sometimes they will highlight words that are actually spelled correctly. You know, it, it's just like a brand name or a, a word in a different language, um, but they'll highlight it as incorrect. There always has to be a human being to make sure is it actually incorrect or is it just the AI not knowing that word? Um, so similarly in medicine, those things happen as well. Um, I, you know, I think technology in medicine is always very exciting. There's always new research and new designs and new products and new devices and those kind of things. That's, um, and certainly AI is a big, big topic. Um, I don't, I personally don't see a lot of it in my day-to-day -day practice. Um, I'm sure it's working in the background somewhere. Um, um, but that's one of the things I really like about a surgical specialty is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, the surgeries need to be performed by a human being and, um, and uh, which, which I really still, still really enjoy that, that aspect of it. But um, and even if you use a robot or something like that, you know, um, you know, there's a, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a better outcome. All right. So that's one of the things I think too, like, you know, it's easy for, 
the lay public to get sucked into buzz buzzwords like robotic or minimally invasive or you know cutting edge or these kind of things those terms not, don't necessarily mean anything and could just pretty much just incur extra costs on patients for, for no reason. Um, and so um, I think one of the biggest things too, to, to realize is like also like just because it's new and improved doesn't necessarily, it is better for the patient. And sometimes it takes a long, long, long time um, for us as uh, to, to, to the medical community to have really solid data and evidence that one, you know, one, procedure or one medicine or something like that is, is, is actually beneficial. And it takes, it takes a really, really, really long time for new drugs to become developed and, and those kind of things and, and show an efficacy. Um, and so um, before we, you know, the general, you know, before physicians feel comfortable prescribing certain things and stuff. So, but I think technology in general, I mean, it's always influencing um, how we conduct medicine and how we, how we go about our daily lives, whether it's just to approve our out workflows, like, you know, um, Isabella said versus AI to, you know, specifically target things that I do on a daily basis. But um, I personally, in, in, in our field, we don't see a ton of it yet, but that doesn't mean it's not coming and, and will improve our lives on a, you know, and, and our patients' lives, for that matter. All right, great. Thank you. So next we'll kind of just be opening up, you know, to the floor. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. If anyone has any questions that you want to ask Isabella or Kevin, you can feel free to just type them. So the first question that we have from the audience is, um, what are some of the things that, you know, being a doc, you know, what are some of the struggles that being a doctor um, comes with? Is there anything that you don't enjoy about being a doctor? I personally never enjoyed breaking bad news to patients. Um, it is a skill that can be trained. You know, there is almost a very formulaic way in which you break bad news to someone, but it's never fun. Um, in my intern year, uh, we I also had to pronounce people dead, which is also not a skill you learn in medical school. You kind of just show up first day as a baby doctor and they're like okay this person died go pronounce them and it's just you and that dead body in the room and you're like oh okay that's cool um that was a struggle um I think something that people don't know when they first start you know the pre-med track is just how much testing we have to do so you take the MCAT, which is a huge exam. I hated the MCAT. You take the MCAT and then in medical school and early residency, you have to take three board exams. Step one, step two, step three. The first step one is like an eight hour exam. Step two is like another eight, nine hour exam. Step three is a two day exam. The first day is like eight hours. The second day is like 13 hours. It's like, it's crazy. And each one of these exams costs thousands of dollars to take. So these exams that you're required to take, you have to pay money to take them. And then even after those initial board exams in your, in your own specialties, there's more exams. So it is truly just a lot of studying, a lot of exams. Um, if you're someone that really detests standardized testing, it's going to be really tough. Um, and I guess that's all I can think of right now. You know, I would just, I'm just looking at some of the comments in the chat here too. And I remember, you know, certainly being a, a member of the Chinese American community, like, and kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, like, you know, there are a million different ways to get into medicine. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that you have to go through a preordained path. Like you have to be a biology major and in, in this thing, and you have to go to a specific type of medical school and you have to, you know, rush through the process and get to work as soon as possible. Like I remember feeling a lot of those anxieties as a Chinese American growing up in Northern Virginia. Like you, you were always pushed to like, it's like, why would you take a year off? Why would you learn something different? Why would you? And that's just simply just, you know, there are, there's so much more to medicine than biology, you know, like, and, and you're going to, and, and to, 
you're going to learn plenty of biology in medical school. You don't have to do a whole major in it um, to, to, to be a good medical student. I mean, um, you'll have to take those classes anyway as you prepare for the MCAT. So if you want to learn French or if you want to learn business or finance or literature or dance or whatever you want to learn, you know, go do that, right? This is your opportunity in your early 20s, you know, late teens and stuff like that to learn whatever you want. You got the whole world ahead of you that you don't have to be a biochemistry major and, and go to pre-med interest groups and those kind of things. Like that is, that, that's only one path and that's not the only path, right? You can take a couple of years off, you can work in a different field and come back into medicine. It's always going to be there. And, you know, one person said in the chat, it's like, well, you know, it takes a long time to be an attending, but you don't have to be a medical doctor to be in medicine, right? You can be a PA, you can be an NP, you can be a nurse, you can be like, you know, you can do incredible things and be involved in the care of patients' lives without having to be an MD, you know? And, and that's really the important thing here is that, you know, um, it doesn't have to be this, this very specific way. I know it's, you know, in our culture, certainly being a doctor is like, you know, a minimum in some ways, right? But that doesn't have to be the case. You know, there's plenty of really absolutely rewarding fields within medicine that don't have to have MD behind your name, you know? And so, um, so just kind of keep that in mind and just kind of keep that, those, those sort of societal pressures in mind and, and the misconception that that's the only way you can do things. You know, I learned more about medicine from two poetry classes than four years of biochemistry courses. I don't use any biochemistry at all in my daily practice. I don't use any of my analytical chemistry classes or my physics courses or any of that stuff. I don't use calculus on my day-to-day -day basis. Like all those classes, you know, I barely even use. And, 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 and then another kind of crazy but terrifying thing is half the things you learn in medical school are completely out of date by the time you graduate from medical school. Right. So really medical school just teaches you how to be a person compassionate and teaches you how to learn really, really fast and memorize a lot of things really, really quickly. I don't remember much. I mean, like a lot of things in medicine now, we're all so hyper specialized, man. Like I really only just know what an ear is. That's about it. You know, I don't you know, forget about what the heart does and the lungs and everything else. You know, I'm not a specialty. I'm not a specialist in that anymore. You know, I'm, everyone gets so hyper-specialized sometimes, you know, that, um, that you can actually be that way and stuff. So, um, anyway, I'm sort of rambling here, so I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you for sharing. This is a real life quote from one of our audience. He says someone sitting in the audience. All right. So I want to be a doctor, but the amount of time it takes to become an actual doctor deters me. I feel like I might be wasting my life or time. How do you navigate this feeling? Um, so I'm almost 30. Um, I'm I'm still in training. But the way I saw it was like, I'm going to be 30 eventually. And I could either be 30 and a doctor or 30 and something else. And I was like, I'd rather be a doctor. Um, it is very, very long. And you make very, very little money for a long time. I think some of my co-residents and I, we calculated how much money we make and how many hours we work. And it, it ended up being like people working at Target made more than us. And we were like, maybe we should go work in Target instead. Um, on those tough days, we definitely thought that. Um, and yet we're still here. <laughs> um, it is a very long time, but life goes on. Um, while you're in training too so you know your friends get married you might get married people have kids during training um, you can move across the country you make time for your friends and family if that's a priority for you so even though training is long you have to still live your life right so prioritize your hobbies prioritize traveling prioritize um, you know your family, things like that. And then, you know, in, in some way, I think the time kind of flies by. I feel like the days and weeks may be long, but the years are pretty short. So um, that's my take. Yeah, I think it depends on what you mean by wasting your life. I mean, I don't find any of the years that I'd spent in training wasting my life. I mean, it just kind of depends on your perspective, what your ultimately your goal is, right? And 
for me to do what I do now, man, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, I love what I do. I think, you know, what I get to do for patients and stuff is so rewarding, but there's only one path to it. And it's a really long path and it should be a long path to be honest with you, because the amount of time it takes to be good at this thing, you know? And so, and don't forget that just because you're in training does not mean you're a, you're not a yeah. doctor, right? You're mm -hmm. still taking care of patients. I mean, it just depends on if, if you're in a rush to just make money, then yeah. Okay. There's other ways to do that much quicker than being in medicine. Right. But most of us don't go in medicine for, to make money. We, uh, we're all smart enough to go into other much more money making endeavors than for that matter. Right. But we do it because we want to take care of patients and we want to learn and be a physician or be someone in healthcare. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's just, but, but again, like I said, there's so many different paths in, 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 in medicine. You don't have to be a medical doctor necessarily to, 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 to do rewarding things for patients. Right. And so, um, just keep that in mind, you know, it depends on, you know, again, what do you define as wasting your life? I mean, even though I was a resident or a fellow or something like that, I was taking care of patients. So I was taking care of, you know, being intimately involved in their lives and delivering good news and delivering bad news. I mean, you know, I found that just as rewarding as, as what I do now. So. All right. In general, how much free time do you have every day? And what do you like to do during your free time? I mean, I think that's going to depend on every every single person. That 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 question is very, very, very hard to answer because it's variable um, depending on what you do, what kind of practice you're in, what kind of pressures you have, how many kids you have, what your family's even obligations are, what your, you know, it's like free time for yourself. That's very, very personal. You know, if you have multiple kids and you come home from work, you have to take care of them and, you know, be a part of their lives. Do you really have free time at all? Probably not. And then you go to bed and you go to work the next day. Right. And so that's just, um, that's a very, very tough question to answer. And it's going to be very, very different for every every person and what their aspirations are right and so if, if you're a physician and you only want to work part-time then you'll have a lot more free time but right. if you want to run a research lab and and get funded by the nih and run a busy surgical practice and be a leader in a lot of committees and do all this stuff you're going to have no free time to do anything mm -hmm. um so you have to sign it eventually it's due next week uh -huh. Yeah, I think it like medicine is such a diverse field, so many specialties, so many ways to practice medicine. If you're someone who really prioritizes being at home at a certain hour every day, predictably, there are fields that will let you do that. So like primary care, family medicine, pediatrics, radiology, um, I think even like anesthesiology sometimes, depending on like where you work. Um, if you're someone who wants to work remotely, you know, there's jobs that will let you do that. You, if you just want to work at home or if you want to work from anywhere in the country, I think um, medicine just offers you so many different specialties. Like you can find something that will fit your, your life. Yeah, totally agree with that. All right, we have two questions from Serena. What are some possible research opportunities that might be available during either med school or residency? And how might research be different um, in an in internal medicine specialty versus a surgery specialty? Um, so uh, personally, I did do some research in high school that was very much like basic science research. Like we were looking at molecules and cell pathways, things like that. In medical school, though, I mostly did clinical research. So I wasn't in the lab anymore. I wasn't pipetting. I wasn't working with specimens. I was mostly looking in like the patient record and doing statistics and things like that. So research can look like very different in medical school, mostly because you don't have time to go to the lab. If you do like going to lab, you can, but it is, it just takes away from studying and other things you could be doing. Um, there's also such things like quality improvement projects. So if you're someone who, you know, notices deficiencies in how, you know, 
a class is taught or how patient care is being performed, you can do a quality improvement project that is also not in a lab and also doesn't have to do with like patient charts. So there's all kinds of research you can do in medical school. And the way that you get those opportunities is just like reach out to your professors, reach out to your attending doctors um, if they're doing research and just exploring. Yeah, I agree. I think research opportunities are going to be very dependent on kind of what school you're at and what kind of mentors you have and those kind of things and what research facilities are available. So if you're, I think I would say that it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're at an institution where there's a lot of research, I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities to do whatever kinds of research you want to do. So I will say that there are, unfortunately, you know, aspects of medical medicine that, um, uh, to, you know, there's certain specialties that you have to do a lot of research for, which is a little bit ridiculous, to be honest with you, but that's, that's unfortunately the, the way it is, if you will. So one of the, my biggest, you can say failures, if you will, was that um, I discovered my specialty very, very late. And um, I didn't realize that, you know, ENT required a lot of research to apply. And so when I applied to ENT. I didn't get many interviews and I actually didn't match coming out of medical school. I went to UVA for medical school and I didn't match. And that was really tough, you know, and that was really, really tough seeing all my friends graduate and become doctors and post on Instagram about their badges and their white coats and those kind of things. And here I am sitting and, you know, doing nothing. Um, and um, so I did a, I did a year of clinical research and I turned my application around and I matched into my number one choice for residency and those kind of things. And ultimately, you know, did fellowship and here I am now today. So there was, there was that huge detour in my career where I had to undergo that kind of failure and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, research is not, you know, it, it, there's, there are specialties where you need to do a lot of research, even though that if you're not interested in research, that's one of the biggest unfortunate aspects of how medicine is nowadays. I think in certain ways is like, you have to have a certain type of application to be able to apply to certain types of specialties, which is not, that's not intrinsically better. Like the, you don't like, you don't need to be a scientist to be a certain type of physician, but that's just how the game is played, unfortunately. And you have to play to win. You have to play to, you know, you have to um, apply and, and ma match into that specialty. Right. So, um, so for some, for some, fields that research is going to be very, very important. And in that regard, I would say the medical school that you go to is actually really, really, really important. If you're going into a very, very hyper competitive specialty, for example, um, because if you go to a medical school that doesn't even have a department in that specialty, like let's say you want to go to neurosurgery or something, very, very hyper competitive specialty. If you go to a medical school without a neurosurgery department, you're going to be at a massive disadvantage applying to neurosurgery. Um, so just keep that in mind. Great. Want to quickly share a fan mail from Danny. Thank you so much, Isabella and Kevin. This is so genuine and inspiring conversation. Just wanted to share that. Okay. So the next question that we have, um, how might careers be different in an academic setting versus a private practice? Um, I'll answer this because I'm I'm in practice right now. I guess um, uh, so uh, they can be very different. Um, I think you know obviously in academia, but but they can be very different. But they can also be very similar, which is kind of interesting, right? There are you can be in quote unquote academic medicine and never work with residents, never work with medical students, never work with fellows or anything like that. And you're like, why in the world am I? You know, but but you could be at like an outlying site. For example, like let's say here at Northwestern, I could be in the Western suburbs and be a Northwestern physician and I could be an hour away from our downtown facility and really hardly ever work with people um, and trainees and those kind of things and not have to do research and not have to give lectures and those kind of things. So instead, you can be in a quote unquote, private practice setting, but just academic, you know, academic in that setting. Um, I think certainly by being in academia, I am in academia right now, I'm an academic physician. Um, I do have expectations to do research and work with medical students and give lectures and teach and teach train residents how to, and fellows how to do surgery. 
Um, so that I love that aspect of it. But I also know people in private practice that also do that as well. So, um, and they make a lot more money than me, I'll tell you that. So there is a huge, there usually is a large wage gap between, it can be an enormous wage gap between academics and, and private practice. Um, but, you know, I picked this for a reason. I, I, um, I do really enjoy teaching and, and being involved and doing research and, and, you know, being on um, various leadership positions and, and um, being a referral center. So, but, you know, you, you can't have a perfect job, but I think what, what people don't realize is that there are so many, so many, so many different types of practices that exist, you know, so many different types. Um, you will have private, I have a friend who's a radiologist in, in a, um, a private practice and he is, you know, his management is just grinding him to the bone with how much they're pressuring him to work and, you know, churn out reads, you know, and he's working into the wee hours of the night, you know, um, but that's just his practice. And he's really upset with that practice right now. And he's thinking about leaving. So it's, it's just so different. You can be at a practice where you're really, really happy and making, you know, and, and your hours are totally different. It's just, again, it's all depending on the, the quality of the business model and those kind of things. So. Yeah, I have nothing to add. Um, all of my experience has been in academic setting. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Thank you so much to Isabella and Kevin. Um, yeah, personally, you know, as someone that, um, you know, I don't really know much about medicine. I really learned a lot um, today. So thank you so much for sharing, you know, your own experiences and your journey. Um, and I'll hand it back to Stan. All right. Um, what a wonderful session. And I want to thank the speakers for, um, you know, taking your time from your busy life. We kind of hear what your life look like and also open yourself um, up to the entire audience sharing a prof professional journey and sharing, you know, your sort of some aspect of your personal life we truly appreciate. And I think as all the audience can feel, you know, what drives you guys through this long journey? You know, I think the question asked uh, by one of the um, young audience, I think it's, um, it's probably common when people before making a commitment, what really helps to go through this entire journey we hear resoundingly tonight is your passion. I think the passion to make a difference, the passion of saving life in the, in the, in the medical field, the passion of improving the quality of life. I think that's, you know, we can hear those are the sort of common elements between two of you. So um, I think for those young students out there, um, I, I hope you get the same message and don't be afraid of this journey. Even if it's, it's long, but you still, I think, you know, you hear the speaks that, that you still live your life. And I think the experience during that long journey is still worthwhile even though it's tough but I think if you enjoy it um you may not feel that difficult um um I again I think there are many quotes we hear from the audience and it's um you know it's great to having two um doctors at different stage of their career Isabella is in the residency and Kevin has already gone through the process and in the faculty position um and I think, you know, and also they're in two different fields. Uh, um, Kevin is in the surgery and Isabella is radiology. It's kind of two different fields. I hope all the audience enjoy the insight from the different sort of fields. I think if you are interested in medicine, I think there's a many ways, you know, you can uh, make the difference. And I, I really like Kevin's quote, that there's many journeys to Rome. Uh, you don't have to be, I think in, Living in this uh, Northern Virginia, the uh, Chinese American community, um, you know, I met a lot of, um, uh, worked many of the, in the parents and kids. I've seen the common sort of invisible pressure of everyone try to be in a rush to success, have to be get there quickly. So I think thank you, Kevin, to sharing your philosophical sort of experience. Really, you know, you have, you don't have to rush. You just slow down, enjoy life, enjoy the process. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you work for 30 years versus 29 years, ultimately in your life, what's the big difference? Right, exactly. And and luckily, I'm also um, in the medical field. I'm not directly working patients. I'm right now. 
I'm um, working as a, a program director managing a few different diseases. And I work a lot of the talented doctors throughout the country. Some of them actually look at their resume. Um, compared to journey, Kevin and uh, Isabella going, it's really very short. You know, some of them take additional years of, you know, specialty training to get far. So um, that's what's the nature of medicine. I think medicine um, um, is still, it's, uh, um, you know, it's a field that we have a lot of unknowns and then knowns. So there are many challenges, disease impact, you know, the humanity. I think uh, we appreciate those, you know, uh, young um uh, passionate doctors like uh, Kevin and Isabella to willing to make the commitment and uh, help the humanity. So with that, I think we'll uh, close the session a little bit early since we, our third uh, um, speaker, she is unfortunate, um, is stuck in the ICU. Otherwise, you know, we have another sort of uh, story from a different patient, uh, doctors. So with that, we will um, close our session and I Thank you all to participate in that session. And for future um, young professional series, we uh, have few sessions in planning. Uh, the next one is in AI and data science. And uh, the following session is computer and software engineer. So we will um, uh, make an announcement as time goes by. So um, with that, I wish you all a wonderful evening and uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, um, uh, meeting you again in the future. Again, I'm sorry, I, I want to make a acknowledgement uh, to our two wonderful uh, moderators, Sarah and um, Karen, and I made a mistake in the beginning. I had a slide and forgot to share, you know, I have technology challenge. I thought I shared, but I didn't, um, my apology. And also I want to acknowledge uh, the team um, behind, um, you know, making that seminar series uh, possible. So we have a, a small team. I want to acknowledge uh, them here. They're all like busy parents. Um, um, so we have Denise Han, uh, we have Yulan and uh, Kathleen uh, Lee. And so with that, um, uh, again, I want to thank you all for, um, um, you know, spending the Thursday night with us and have a wonderful uh, Lab Day weekend. Um, um, bye now. All right. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah. 
哎，请问我们是结束了吗
Light to make this mouth delicious. 